Welcome to the organic chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 81 to 85. So first I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 81, 82, 83, 84, and 85. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 81, we're asked which of the following represents the amino acid methionine at a pH below its isoelectric point. So here we're given methionine, and all of these are the structure for methionine, that's fine. But we want to know it at a pH below its isoelectric point. So what is the isoelectric point? That is the pH at which you have the amino acid being an overall neutral molecule. So its overall formal charge is zero. And we know that there's an equilibrium. If you go to a higher pH to the right, then you would start to get a negatively charged molecule. And if you have a lower pH, you would get a positively charged molecule. And then this can go even further and you can get a plus two charge because methionine, its side chain contains a sulfur and then that sulfur can go grab another proton and then be S plus, SH plus. So we are talking about methionine at a pH below its isoelectric point. That means that we are talking about when it's plus one charged. So since the pH is lower, these arrows are wrong. They should be equilibrium arrows. Let me just fix that. They should be going like that. Yeah, but getting back to what I was saying, if you are at a low pH, that means that more protons are available. Therefore, things that can get protonated are going to be, and you're going to begin seeing positive charges. On the right side, you would have more basic environment, and then you'd see negative charges. So we're talking about a pH below so its isoelectric point. That means we're talking about the plus one charge. We can go to a pH much lower than the isoelectric point. That's when it would be fully charged, but we don't want to see something where the side chain is also charged. We're just talking about a pH that's slightly below the isoelectric point, or like at least one pH removed from the isoelectric point. So option A is incorrect because this is an overall neutral molecule. See that we have a negative charge over here. So this one's negative. And then on the, on the carboxyl group, it's negative. On the amine group, it's positive. Therefore, those two charges are going to cancel out. There's no other charge. And this is an overall neutrally charged molecule, but that's not what we're looking for. That's if we had methionine at its isoelectric point, but we're talking about below. Option B, there is a positive charge here, and you can see that the carboxyl group is protonated, so it has no charge. And then the sulfur is also uncharged, therefore it has a plus one charge, and that's correct. That is the correct structure we're looking for once again methionine below its isoelectric point, so it's going to be plus one charge, and this is the one that's plus one charge, so that's correct. Over here, in option C, we see that both the carboxyl group and the amine group are neutral, so those are neutral. There's nothing to cancel out there. There's no plus or minus charge. However, there is a plus charge over here. This should, It should really be over here. I'm not sure why it's on the methyl group. So it should be on, a meth on the sulfur group, and then there's a plus charge over here. So this compound is, it's also plus one charged. However, it's not correct because it doesn't make sense for the sulfur to be protonated, but the amine group to not be protonated. This amine group should be NH3+, plus if we're at a low enough pH that the sulfur group is also being protonated. So since that doesn't logically make sense, this isn't the correct answer. And then finally, in option D, we have negative charge here and a positive charge here. Those cancel out. However, there's also a positive charge over here. So if it was here, that also logically doesn't make sense. If the carboxyl group is negatively charged, that means that we must be at a, at a pH high enough to do that. So like somewhere above pH 4, and then it doesn't make sense that the sulfur group then is protonated because the sulfur group would be protonated or deprotonated much before the carboxyl group would be. So this molecule also, it doesn't make sense how it would exist. 
and overall its charge is plus two, so it's not the correct structure. So B is the correct answer here. In question 82, it says a carbocation is surrounded by two hydrogen atoms and a third group. Which of the following third groups bound to the carbocation would render the carbocation most stable? So we have a carbocation, so it'll have three groups. Two of them are hydrogen, and then we have a third group, and we want to know which one would make the carbocation most stable. So we have a carbocation, which looks like this. And then what R group would stabilize the carbocation? So the thing with carbocations is that it's a carbon that's missing electrons, therefore it's positively charged. It doesn't like to be positively charged, it wants to do something to get rid of that charge, so usually it's attacked by a nucleophile. However, if something can happen to el donate electron density into this middle carbon, then it's going to feel the effect of that positive charge less, and then be overall more stable. So this is all about the inductive effect. And therefore we want something which is an electron donating group, and methyl is fine, because a methyl group is just going to be a carbon attached with three other hydrogens, and then the carbocation, the positively charged carbon, it can take electron density from that methyl group, and then it doesn't feel the effect of the positive charge anymore, whereas a nitro group contains a nitrogen, that's going to be electronegative, and because of the inductive effect, it's actually going to pull more electron density away from the positive charge, activating it further for reaction, meaning that it's less stable, but we want to make it more stable. So a nitro group is incorrect, a fluoride group, because of the same principle, the electronegativity, is going to be an electron withdrawing group. Same thing with a carboxyl group. So any type of carbonyl is going to be pulling away electron density. Therefore, options B, C, and D are incorrect. We want something that's electron donating to make a more stable carbocation. In question 83, we're asked, what is the formal charge of the carbon in cyanide? So we want the formal charge. We want it for carbon, and we want it for cyanide. Cyanide looks like this. It's CN with an overall negative charge. And then when we do the, when we make the Lewis structure, carbon has four valence electrons. The nitrogen should have five. And then we have one extra due to the, the negative charge. So that overall gives us 10 electrons to work with. And so this is what our Lewis structure will look like. So there should be, for nitrogen, it likes to have three bonds. So we'll give it three like this. So I'm doing this quicker. Um, there are different steps that you would do for making a Lewis structure, but I'm just trying to speed this up. For cyanide, you should know that there's a triple bond. So we have those three bonds and then nitrogen, it wants eight around it. So right now we can say it has one, two, three, four, five, six. So if we give it two more, that's seven, eight. And then how many electrons have we used? Eight. We have 10, so the other two must go to the carbon. And then the way that we determine form formal charge is thinking about, so before I looked at the, both electrons in the bond for seeing if the octet rule is filled, but now I want to see the formal charge of every atom. So I look at the actual electrons around it. So nitrogen should have five because of its five valence electrons. And right now it has one, two, three, four, five. Therefore, it's neutral. Carbon should have four electrons around it. That's what its valence electrons are. That's the number of them. But right now we have one, two, three, four, and five, meaning we have an extra electron for the carbon. So carbon has a negative charge, okay? So this is what the structure looks like. Carbon usually likes to have four bonds to something. But in this case, it doesn't have that fourth bond, but instead it has both electrons that it would if it like was bonded to something else. So you can kind of think of it as carbon used to have another fourth bond to another atom, but then that atom left and left its electron behind. And now carbon took that electron and that extra electron gave it a negative charge. So in cyanide, the negative charge is on the carbon and it's a minus one charge. In question 84, it says the R and antimer of a compound rotates light minus 8 degrees. A solution composed of 90% of the S enantiomer and 10% of the R enantiomer, so here this should be R enantiomer, would rotate light blank. So how many degrees? So we can't just, you know, like look at an enantiomer an an and say that it rotates light a certain direction. This is something that needs to be experimentally determined, but here it's given to us. 
So we're told that the R enantiomer rotates like negative 8 degrees. And then we have 90% of the S enantiomer, 10% of the R enantiomer. So if the R enantiomer rotates like negative 8 degrees, so R is negative 8. Therefore, S has to rotate like the opposite direction, which means it's going to rotate like positive 8 degrees. And then this is a pretty simple arithmetic question. We have 90% S enantiomer, so we have 0 0.9 times 8. And then we add to that 10% of negative 8. And then when we just add those things together, we will get how many overall degrees we get. So this compound, the solution, is going to rotate light. This is going to be equal to 6.4 degrees. So C is our correct answer. In question 85, it says the conversion of glucose to gluconic acid. It is an example of which type of reaction? So we take glucose, we turn it into gluconic acid. What's the type of reaction? So glucose, if we have the linear chain at the top, it looks like this. Okay, so like usually like for glucose, you have something going like that. And then we have all the other carbons. But uh, for for uh, gluconic acid, what happens is it turns into this type of molecule. The aldehyde got converted to a carboxylic acid. So we're pretty much just asked, when you take an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid, what happened? So what happened is that we oxidized it. It's an oxidation reaction. So you should know that carboxylic acids are one oxidation level higher than an aldehyde. On the molecule on the left, we had two bonds to oxygen. Now we have a new bond to oxygen. So usually, when you see new bonds being formed to oxygen or you see hydrogens being taken away like that is it should make you think that oxidation is going on so it's an oxidation type reaction it's not an acetylation reaction that is when you add this group to something something else but that group was already present it's not like we added a carbonyl group it was already present we just turned it into a different type of carbonyl it's not an alkylation that's where you would add some carbon chain it's not a hydrogenation that's essentially a reduction reaction. And so that's the opposite of what's going on. Hydrogenation should add more hydrogen. So for example, if this aldehyde went to an alcohol, that would be the addition of another hydrogen. Therefore, that would be a reduction or a hydrogenation reaction. But in this case, we see an oxidation reaction taking place. And that's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is in the description below. In that course, we go through a lot more questions just like we did in this video, going through all the different answer options and explaining why each one is right or wrong. Other than that, make sure to subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with the videos that we post here. And that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.